Okay, welcome back, everyone. And uh, we're going with our agenda we're for the Committee of the Whole at this time. Everybody get a chance to pull out their agenda. Is there any decoration of pecuniary interest with regards to the Committee of Whole? All right, if one does arise, you can uh, declare it and do the proper paperwork. So there is a consent agenda in front of us right up from A to H. Are there any of those items wish to be pulled? If not, can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Burley, Councillor Desai. Since there's no discussion on them, all in favor? That is carried. Okay. <clears throat> that makes it half the day gone right there. Right? <laughs> All right, so items for discussion. Um, number A, can I, with regards to the community safety and well-being plan, can I have a mover and a seconder for that one, please? Councillor Keebany, seconder by Councillor Mackey. Okay, Barb, welcome. Just when you're, good morning, just when you're ready, the floor is, sorry. Good morning, Mr. Warden, County Council. Um, this morning I'm just going to talk to you a little bit um, about the community safety and well-being plan uh, that we've been working on. Um, I'm going to give a bit of a briefing and then I'll run through the presentation that was attached. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, there will be some highlights I'll provide. Uh, I think you'll see this more than once. There'll be some work happening in, in your municipalities. But I wanted to provide an overview of where we are at. So um, what we're looking for today with the report is um, approval that a bylaw be brought forward authorizing the agreement for community safety and well-being between Gray County, Bruce County, and 16 participating local municipalities that are listed. So um, when I move through this, I think if you have any questions, I, I'll be prepared to stop um, at any given time because this, this is um, it's a mandated um, initiative and uh, I think you may have some questions and if not I'm always available for that as well. So in January of last year, a full year now, um, there was some legislation um, that was provided to us through the Police Services Act and it came into force that we need to have a plan in place for uh, January 1st of 2021. That's not that far down the road now. Um, so in two-tier municipal government locations, uh, it's the local municipalities that have been designated um, to produce and provide this. And so here, uh, with the local number of stakeholders that we do have, there was support for a collaborative initiative. And our CAO brought a report forward this past summer that brought um, uh, the coordination together. And um, through the leadership, uh, we have considered a consultant and we've been working towards implementation. Um, so, uh, since that time, we've had several key actions. We have an advisory committee established. We have a steering committee established. Um, right now, we have in excess of 50 municipal, organizational, and agency, as well as community representatives at the advisory committee. It's fairly large, uh, not as nimble as we'd like it to be, but it needs to be inclusive. And so, um, we're moving forward with some... Um, next steps and I'll get to those as well. But at the table, um, there are there's representation from Gray County, Bruce County, the Health Unit, Victim Services and Police Services. And that's just at the steering committee. With regard to the larger group, we have um, many, many uh, representatives of a variety of sectors, plus a lot of the network tables that already exist. So in excess of the 50 plus organizations, there are many, many others that are represented. We've been meeting regularly, um, and the municipalities have, are adopting bylaws now to execute this agreement, so they're coming forward now. Um, it was actually a working group of uh, municipal clerks that drafted the bylaw language that, uh, that is included in the, in the agreement today. So you may have had this already come through your municipal um, councils. Um, in, for our next steps, um, we will be engaging in sessions that are occurring now in January right through till April where we're identifying um, gaps and risk assessments for the municipalities. Um, so we're developing a survey at this point. We are moving forward with, um, as I mentioned, the town halls. There will be opportunity for um, many different styles of engagement. Uh, 
led by the steering committee and the, and the coordinator. Also though, um, two pre-existing um, um, tables that are already meeting in your communities. The, the intention is to do a deep dive and really determine what's happening. It's recognized that some of the risks that are happening in communities, for example, in Northern Bruce Peninsula are not the same as in Southgate municipality. So we're, we're trying to capture what that local relevance is and involve the local, um, the local reflection. Um, and um, we acknowledge that there will be a website established. It's under development at this time, and the communication will flow two-way through that as well, uh, hoping to ensure that, that um, there is an, uh, multiple ways of communicating with the steering committee and the advisory committee and the work as we lead forward to our January 1st implementation. So the legal legislative requirements are here for you to see. Um, they're also contained within the agreement. And the funding for this initiative is a joint funding initiative through Gray County and Bruce County. Um, I'll maybe stop there. Are there any questions with regard to the work that's been done so far? Any questions there? Thank you. So uh, at this time, we're asking for approval to move forward with the bylaw to be drafted. So you have nothing more to you have nothing more to add then. Thank you. Um, I'll be moving through the presentation afterwards. Okay. Thank you. So as mentioned, we have a presentation that was attached, and it is quite lengthy, and I apologize, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing with you today. So just giving you some background on why this planning is underway, um, we have that legislative requirement that's mandated across the province, and we needed to develop our, our we have um, a framework and a planning process in place, and so this PowerPoint will take you through what's happening and, and where we need to get to. Um, just again about the overview, um, the fact that um, we do have some documents that precede us. There have been many municipalities that were pilots within this and we've got some great um, learning from these, some analysis that has helped us um, expedite our processes. Uh, there, the fact is, uh, without a collaborative approach, people are working in silos, and it's recognized that this is best. This is best practice for multiple sectors to work together to address some of the very difficult risks that we're facing in communities today. Um, that's the men, the legislation. And I don't think I need to go into that. It does talk about who needs to be at your table. So we have worked through these documents and ensured that the required agencies and organizations and participants are with us. The framework, we're using um, a specific framework and it was determined for us uh, given the pilot work that was happening. So we're determining what those critical risks are and then what the mitigating situations that elevate those risks. We're, we're working towards reducing uh, what they are and how to get to a, a promoting and maintaining our safety and well-being. So uh, we're still in the forming and storming stages and for the first four months of this year, we'll be gathering um, information on what the risks are based on each municipality that's involved with us. Some of our success factors will be um, recognizing that we have uh, we're working together um, and not uh, in silos, that we've determined what our risks are, that we have a better understanding of what the underlying, um, what's underlying some of the challenges in our communities, um, that we have buy-in from our individuals, that we have uh, our partnerships are strong, and that we use our evidence and use our research that takes us to a, a baseline that allows us to be able to measure our impact and that we're responding with um, cultural uh, needs as well. We're reflecting the cultural needs and diversity within communities. So just a, a bit of um, the benefits of why we want to do this. Again, I've gone through most of those, but there are some significant cost benefits that we're hoping to see. We know that uh, almost all of our programs that are uh, provincially funded have had decreases in funding um, through budget cuts or at least maintaining um, the funding that hasn't allowed for any additional um, funding or programs. So we have to do things differently and we need to do them together. So this, this kind of planning helps us to do that. And of course it's going to um, help us to understand the risks to our vulnerable groups. 
Um, this uh, page 13 is just a couple quotes. Uh, and I think you're going to start to see some of these through social media. You're going to start to see some of these through um, some of the work that's happening. We, the, the ones that are contained on this page include uh, those that have gone before us, but I just saw one this morning from Prescott Russell, and um, it's, uh, I, I just speak to it, um, and it's a quote from the CAO, uh, Stéphane Parisien, and what he's saying is the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan identifies risks and proactively develops evidence-based strategies and programs to address local priorities related to crime and complex social situations and issues. These strategies can then be implemented. So again, on the right path, we think we're, we're heading down the same path as, as many of our colleagues are. Um, and the I guess a year from now, we're hoping to come back with some information of how it's being implemented and what the, the sustainability plan will look like. Just um, a model of how we're planning. Um, I don't think I need to go into that. But some of the um, those that have gone before us, and one that we're using and have connected directly with is our Halton counterparts. They have an urban and a rural base. They have um, multiple services across their system. So it really works well with our model. Just a really complicated slide for you. <laughs> I'm going to skip that one. Champions. We have some champions. And I mentioned who was on the steering committee. Um, but we will be coming forward with um, some, some possible um, some roles for folks, especially around this table and, and at your lower tier municipalities that can help us to move this forward. Our coordinator is, is on task and um, meets with us regularly and provides the information back to us. The key tasks are keeping the appropriate agencies and organizations informed, bringing them together through that advisory committee, um, planning and coordinating these meetings, developing all the terms of reference, those were attached as well to the report, um, the engagement sessions that are rolling out, planning and coordinating those, and then ensuring that the decisions are acted upon and receiving and responding any requests for information. A lot of those are coming through now and, and we are responding in kind. Um, and then ensuring that the plan is publicly available. That goes back to our communication strategy. Steering committee. Um, we have the steering committee that supports the coordinator and supports the larger group advisory. I won't go into that. Your steering committee members are listed, including myself and my counterpart from Bruce County, Krista Miller from um, the South Bruce OPPs, representing the police sector, and then the health unit, as well as victim services. Um, talks about uh, The next slide talks about what the commitment is on behalf of the advisory committee, who's on that advisory committee, responsibilities, key tasks, and then action teams will come out of that advisory committee. And that will depend on who is where, which municipality you're from, um, how do we determine who needs to be involved in the risk assessment, and we're currently working on that. Um, again, the action team membership, the responsibilities, phases of work. I thought this was important for you. So we're past the startup. We're currently in the asset mapping. Um, which are reviewing the existing bodies, who we can use, uh, leverage the work they've already done. We don't want to start things over again. We're going to use what's out there. Um, we're analyzing any of those social networks that are in place and creating an inventory of the strategies. The engagement piece is well underway for uh, the planning. We have um, dates being booked, meetings, uh, all the logistics being planned, engaging with our community and not simply, or not simply, but I, uh, as well as the partners that are already at the table. The risk analysis will occur once we gather the data and then we'll start that logic model to determine how we're going to measure our performance and finally the adoption later this fall. You can see by uh, page 42 that timeline. We're already um, over halfway through January so we're moving quickly. And so uh, this talks about where we begin and I've already been there. I've talked about the asset mapping. The engagement, um, so very important. Lots of engagement strategies underway. The town hall meetings, uh, focus groups by sector, one-to-one -one interviews, email, um, information sharing. We've got a, a survey that's almost ready to go out. And then um, specialty populations. We will be determining how do we get to our priority populations. Um, and then we need to come back with the, the summary that we found, identify our risks and our priorities. And moving forward, then we talk about that sustainability. It's all well and good to have this underway for planning, but the biggest piece, I believe, will be how do we carry it forward and how do we continue with the momentum that we've built. So we'll be coming back with some strategies there as well. Okay. Any questions at this point? 
So I have Councillor Desai and then I have Councillor Millen. Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, to you, my question to uh, Director Fady uh, is with regards to the uh, community drug and alcohol strategy, we, uh, at that working group we, we also discussed quite a few uh, issues which, which do deal directly uh, with community safety and well-being. Um, my question for you is, is, is there a role for representation from that committee on the community safety and well-being um, group and vice versa? Um, Thank you for that question. Um, there is definitely a role. And um, actually the coordinator, Allison, is sitting at the uh, as one of the advisory committee members to ensure that there is um, engagement and back and forth uh, info sharing. It's recognized we can't possibly bring all the folks that are at all of those tables, but by having the uh, the coordinator involved, there will um, it'll reduce duplicity and ensure that we reach even further uh, deep into community, especially with strategies that are already underway. Thank you. Councillor Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, do I understand uh, from what you just presented and what I read that Joe Public will have opportunities through town halls and so on to be involved, and that and that's a good thing. But uh, that having asked that, uh, I, I take heart from the statement here in your report that says the director of social services will serve as leadership in consultation with the CEO. I have full faith and confidence that the leadership is well looked after. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. And uh, I think what this is recognizing is that we deal with vulnerable populations. And we do have um, anecdotal information. We have contact. We have... Um, um, we might have statistics that are coming through the province and we might have statistics through the health unit, but given the um, actual on the ground day to day services provided by myself, my colleague Anne Marie, um, our staff that are doing the outreach, we, we recognize what's happening in communities. So um, uh, Kim's been very supportive of this moving forward and has um, uh, supported our initiatives to uh, you utilize the services of someone who can keep us coordinated while we dig into the weeds, if you will. And the prior comment, um, Brian, that you mentioned about um, engaging with um, the public, that's a huge piece for us because we, we know we're working with priority populations, but we also know that there are other families and folks out there that are experiencing things that never really get to us. So we're giving an opportunity with a number of means to be able to get um, that to us. That survey is very comprehensive. Um, we engaged with that advisory committee to determine how do we reach the people in town of Blue Vest? How do we reach the people in King Carden and um, all the various municipalities to be able to make sure that they do have access? If you can't get to a face-to-face, -face, what other meetings are already in play that we could give you the survey, even if we can't get there as part of the steering committee, but you can get the information and get it back to us. So multiple ways and means to be able to gather that. Okay. Okay. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and through you to Barb. Barb, are you optimistic that this process will help break down some of the uh, silos that are currently existing? Great question, Scott. Um, I am optimistic. I think we've already seen some dialogue that's um, been uh, non-existent in the past, or difficult, because um, without the mandate, this is a policing mandate, and sometimes it's difficult to um, for civilian and groups to speak the policing language, uh, even police to police. With a number of services, the coordination isn't always as easy. Um, we have OPP, we have municipal services, and in the two counties, there's a number of them. So um, it's, it's required at this point, and there hasn't been any um, issue with gathering the information or moving forward. I think the leadership of having um, someone at the steering committee, um, someone such as, as Krista Miller, um, has been brilliant uh, because she, she uh, is recognized as a leader amongst her sector and she's ensuring that there's, there's um, information flowing two ways. Any other questions? Councillor Debris and then Councillor Hex. Thank you, Mr. Warden, through you to Barb. I was um, in one of the sessions at the Roma Conference, Rural Social Health, where they spoke about 
the, the opioid, cri opioid crisis, the human trafficking, and the hate crime issues. That was then brought to the Minister's Forum where, where someone had asked the question about how we can address those. And it, it popped into my head that this mandated community safety and well-being program is the avenue by which we can, can look at those things more closely and deal with those and assist the police. Policing in rural Ontario is challenged because of geographical distances and those three items were, were talked about quite at length at Roma. So I'm, I think this is a wonderful opportunity and through the questions and your answers, Barb, that this is the right avenue for addressing those issues. So I'm really excited about it and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, I think that um, that is exactly why we are really um, excited, but there's trepidation with it because we know what's under that. It's an onion. Once you start peeling it back, there's a whole lot there. Um, but the only way to get to it is to engage and to work together. Um, the solutions that have been in place um, up to date are chipping away, but working together, we can make a, we can have a bigger impact. We know that we do have an issue in Gray and Bruce County with human trafficking. Um, there are issues, uh, sorry, there are presentations and there's community engagement coming up really soon um, with a number of presentations. There are presentations rolling out to the organizations and shortly there are presentations rolling out to community because it's hard for us to realize that it's actually here. We think of these things as big city problems and unless you have actually had an experience with your family members such as, such as opioid or um, perhaps uh, the human trafficking, um, one of the young ladies that will be presenting is actually from Town of Blue. And so it's very hard to have that in your head that this has a local context. Once we start to move information through and we start to gather the data and share it back out, it becomes um, something everybody wants to be part of to find a solution. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Councillor Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm uh, very pleased to see this uh, report come forward. Um, I was looking at the <coughs> steering committee and the advisory uh, committee, and I see under the advisory committee that there are seven sectors that are sort of anticipated to be represented. Have you um, uh, any idea what size is ideal for an advisory uh, committee, and how do we address uh, sort of regional um, uh, regional issues? You know, quite different from Tobamori to say Southgate. Thanks, Buck. It's very um, true that we're grappling with a little bit of what you're suggesting because um, as much as we are Grey Bruce and we're regional and we're rural, we have a lot of variances. Um, that will come forward when we do our outreach into community specific. There's at least two face-to-face uh, -face, um, community meetings being planned per municipality as well as the survey, as well as the outreach into existing meetings that are actually there. The, um, there could be a kinsman meeting that requires a presentation, those kinds of things. We're, we're digging and asking for help to get to that outreach. Um, we, we need to acknowledge that at the end of this agreement, we'll, at the end of our plan, we will have 16 different um, plans per the, the municipality because Hanover will have certainly a different look than certainly um, a Grey Highlands. It's just about what's happening in your municipality and the goal is for us to work very closely with the people there to be able to extract that information. Um, some of it's a little challenging because you, we, can, we don't want to be identifying, I mean we can't identify individuals, but um, we are definitely looking at the incident reports and the issues that are there. We are using the data that the health unit is providing. We're using data that policing departments are providing. Um, we have data on social assistance. Um, we know that there are organizations that want to be part of this and we're asking for them at this point. We've had to determine, are you, are you involved? Are you wanting to be informed? It's kind of, um, it's keeping everybody in, included, but at, perhaps at a different level. So we've stuck to the model that the province determined where you need, you specifically require these sectors. And then we've included others that we consider very important to the framework. 
but we haven't excluded anyone. We've just um, taken the level of, a, of um, engagement wheel and determined where they fit. And we've worked with the participants to say, do you think you fit in here or do you think you're more intrinsic to the work we're doing? There have been a couple that we've had um, some dialogue on. We, as a steering committee, feel they might fit into this ring and they may feel they fit in elsewhere. So it's a work in progress. Any other questions? I know Barb, I think it was about, I don't know, it was March of last year at the Great Bruce Health Building, they had sort of all the joint uh, police services boards come together for a sort of an introduction of what this was moving forward. And I remember one of the, I don't know, was the officers from uh, South and Bruce Peninsula before the amalgamated green and, and, and that OPP, and they talked about a regional part about the high speeders on that major road and how do we address the public safety on that because it seems once they get out of the GTA, they let the hair down and they whoo. So I know that they sort of, they looked at that as being, how do you address it? Do you, how, do you, how do you address it to the GTA? How do you communicate? Look, it doesn't matter where you are, you're still speeding and, and they identified as that as a, a safety issue along you know along that corridor so that was just one example i don't know if there's anybody else here was at that meeting i know it was very well attended so okay seeing there's no other questions we have it moved by councillor keeveny and the second by councillor mackey all in favor that is carried okay thank you bart so moving on now to our next one with regards to uh scott and with regards to the county's official plan or housekeeping uh, I need a mover and a second for that. Councillor Hicks, second by Councillor Millen. Welcome, Scott. Floor is Great, uh, thanks, Warden McKean and, and members of council. I feel a little guilty after watching Barb's presentation because I have a presentation too, but I'm not sure I can skip any of my slides, but I will still try to be brief. <laughs> so. Um, what we have before us, as, as uh, Warden McQueen introduced, is, is the county's housekeeping amendment. And just as a little refresher, there was the a report that was taken uh, late last year with respect to this matter. And, and it's uh, a number of small items in the county's official plan that uh, we've realized since the province's approval in, in June of 2019 um, that there were some errors and omissions made. And this is a very normal part of, of planning. You might have seen it at your own municipal tables, either through your own official plans or after doing a new comprehensive zoning bylaw. Uh, inevitably, in, in a process that long and in a document of that size, there's, there's gonna be uh, mistakes, if you will. So this uh, housekeeping amendment is, is meant to try to correct some of those mistakes uh, such that we have uh, uh, the best plan we can uh, uh, for, for Gray. Um, there were a number of, of uh, official plan amendments that uh, when the province approved the, the uh, document uh, were, were missed in getting consolidated into the county's plan. Uh, these were all official plan amendments that were approved by council um, and all of them except for the Gibraltar pit uh, official plan amendment in town of Blue Mountains uh, were not appealed as such they were in force and effect. Uh, the Gibraltar pit uh, was appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board slash uh, local planning appeal tribunal. Uh, there were some other minor items in, in the official plan whereby uh, there was a section of land uh, near Walters Falls that inadvertently got designated as a settlement area uh, when in fact it should have been rural. Um, there were a couple pieces of land in Blue Mountains that were missed uh, being designated as spatial space extensive commercial and industrial when in, in the town's plan they were already identified as rural employment lands. Um, there was some, some mapping errors with respect to a core area in the town of Blue Mountains uh, that overlapped one of their settlement areas. Uh, and there were some clarifications needed with respect to uh, Table 8, which is looking at uh, on-farm diver diversified uses, uh, as well as a section uh, in, the, in the rural policies, uh, which speaks to lot creation in aggregate resource areas. So those are some of the things that we were seeking to correct and amend in that regard. On uh, December 10th of, of uh, 2019, we did hold a public meeting in this council chambers. Uh, there was only one member of the public that showed up, but he gave us some comments. Uh, and his comments were very specific to a former official plan amendment in the township of Southgate, which was known as uh, the Hensel Co-op expansion. And, and uh, I've got a, a slide coming up that explains it a little better, but uh, he had a number of concerns with respect to the co-op, which I should note is already in operation, uh, but they haven't gone forward with their expansion yet. Uh, 
Uh, so some of his, his uh, concerns related to the existing co-op, which is, is already legally permitted to be there. And he had concerns about traffic and, and uh, uh, the speed of the trucks coming in and out of the operation, uh, about queuing on the roads and, and the use of jake brakes. He had further concern, concerns about noise and, and dust emissions coming from the, the co-op operation. Uh, he had concerns about um, uh, the timing for the future expansion, uh, as well as whether or not there are going to be any other uh, accessory uses there. Uh, and he also made a comment about the, uh, the accuracy of the map and showing in, in the county's documents. Um, so just to, to give uh, council a refresher, because I believe this official plan amendment was, was uh, actually passed under the previous council, uh, the lands are on the, the northwest side of, of Swinton Park in, in uh, the township of Southgate. Uh, they are primarily agricultural with a small section of, of the settlement area, uh, but the co-op itself is actually outside of the settlement area portion in the agricultural uh, section. Uh, this is a site plan, and in order to line up with the previous map, you'd kind of have to tilt your head sideways. But basically what's shown in gray there is the existing co-op operation. Uh, they already have an entrance out to uh, Southgate Road 24. And then what's shown in, in both orange and green is the expansion. And as part of the expansion, we did hear from members of the community that there were uh, concerns and challenges with the existing operation. And uh, we worked alongside township staff and, and the proponent uh, to look at improvements that could be made to the operation which would help ease some of those concerns to the neighbors uh, including things like putting aspirators and silencers on some of the equipment uh, also including a new entrance onto Southgate Side Road 7 and uh, what you're seeing in green there is actually some some buffer strips that would be included uh, to help uh, uh, both shield the view shed and, and maybe prevent some of the the uh, noise and dust coming from trucks to some of those closest neighbors. Um, we spoke with Mr. Alexander that day at the public meeting and we've since followed up with him in a letter in, in early January after speaking further with township staff and, and with uh, uh, the landowner in this regard. As I said, a number of, of Mr. Alexander's concerns came from the existing co-op operation and, and the expansion has yet to be built yet. Um, should the expansion be built, a number of those improvements that I showed you on the previous slide in, in terms of that site plan will be implemented, uh, but those improvements don't get implemented until such time as that expansion is, is, uh, is going to proceed. Uh, the, the local documents have already been approved in terms of the, the zoning bylaw amendment and, and the township's official plan amendment. Um, but a site plan application has not yet been submitted to the, the township. So when that site plan uh, comes forward, if, if they do seek to go forward with the expansion, um, that's when we can put in some of these site-specific measures to really hopefully address Mr. Alexander's concerns um, as well as, as uh, some of the other neighbors that had spoken out previously. Um, in terms of agency comments, we got comments from some of the conservation authorities and the historic Saugeen and Métis. Uh, we circulated to a broad list of agencies beyond that. And there was no uh, objections to official plan amendment number one by the circulated agencies. Um, as I said before, a number of these official plan amendments had already been, been uh, uh, approved and, and gone through extensive public processes and the, the comments from the public were considered at that time. Uh, there has been a minor change in the Gibraltar pit at the request of the proponent uh, to help further address some, some public concerns and, and some town comments with respect to that, uh, that proposed gravel pit operation. Uh, it's staff's opinion that the, the proposed changes, both in terms of the text and the mapping, uh, will better bring the plan into consistency with the provincial policy statement and will support the intent of what we believe council adopted uh, through Recolor Gray in terms of the 20-year vision for the county. As such, we believe the document, the uh, proposed official plan amendment has regard for matters of provincial interest under the Planning Act. It is consistent with the provincial policy statements, not in conflict with the Niagara Scotland a plan and uh, conforms to the overall goals and objectives of the county's plan. As such, we're recommending that uh, with the comments received both by public and agencies, um, that uh, council consider, or committee of the whole consider receiving the report uh, and that a bylaw be prepared for, for the following county council session. Uh, that's all I have, but I'd certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Is that you in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is our uh, Councillor Mellon? Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I'm just a, it just occurred to me, uh, perhaps I have an interest in this. Well, I do have an interest, particularly in that one. I don't know if it applies to this or not, but through an abundance of caution, I will recuse myself from the table. Take your paperwork. 
All right, thanks for that. Any other comments or questions from uh, council members? I know that, uh, ironically, uh, it was I chaired that meeting when I was planning chair back in, in Southgate, and then I came back and I chaired it again, <laughs> or for that gentleman anyway. So, okay, so seeing there's no other questions, that was moved by Councillor Hex, seconded by Count. Oh, Councillor Millen second that. So we're going to have to get a seconder, right, Madam Clerk? Councillor Desai, that's right. Try to collect that. Another discussion. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. And moving on. The uh, Forest uh, Managed Bylaw. And Sarah, you're taking this one on. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this one, please? Councillor Carlton, Councillor Robinson. Are you taking over or am I taking over? Okay. Good morning, everyone. So county staff are looking uh, to update the forest management bylaw. Um, and just to give um, a committee the benefit of giving them a little bit of background, the existing bylaw that we have was approved in 2006. It has had uh, some updates, um, but essentially we're, we're dealing with a 14-year-old uh, document. It applies to forested areas on both public and private lands, but not individual trees. Um, and those forested areas are classified uh, basically to be a hectare or greater. Um, the day-to-day -day administration of the bylaw is uh, mainly done by the county's bylaw enforcement officer slash uh, forest manager, Lee Thurston. Um, and there are many functions of the bylaw, but um, some of the, one of which the committee will be very familiar with is the minor exemption applications, which I have uh, presented a few in the in the last uh, uh, in 2019. Uh, these are these are the, the requests that we receive where a property owner uh, does want to clear a portion of their property that qualifies as a woodlot, and they have to go through um, a process. Should I stand back a little bit? Okay. Um, so it's, it's very similar. It was modeled after the Planning Act uh, application process in which the application is received, it's processed internally, and then circulated for comment. Once we receive the comments, uh, a recommendation is made and a report is presented to committee for a decision. The second type of application and uh, a large portion of, of what uh, Lee is involved with is the um, managed harvest permit application process. And I'm going to simplify it, but basically what happens is a landowner wants to manage their property. Um, they have the property marked either by themselves or a contractor. An application is submitted and the uh, Lee will go out and verify that the marking conforms to the bylaw and either approves the application or denies it based on that. In addition to um, those main purposes of the bylaw, there are a number of other uh, minor things, um, policies and procedures uh, with regards to uh, the management of forest and, and, um, and penalties that are included in the bylaw as well. Within the county as well, uh, there are three municipalities that have some sort of forestry management bylaw in place, the city of Owen Sound, the town of the Blue Mountains, and the municipality of Meaford. So why do we need to update a by our bylaw? Well, uh, approximately six months after the bylaw was passed, there was a change in the Municipal Act which uh, changed the, pro the enforcement provisions, which essentially would make it easier to enforce and achieve the purpose of the bylaw by rewriting it in its entirety. Um, in addition to this, just over the last 14 years, where staff have identified a number of areas where um, there has been some administration difficulties and it's challenging, uh, to enforce the bylaw, so we just had some suggestions for tweaks and updates to make it easier to enforce. So the intention of the bylaw is to promote sustainable management practices and to prohibit or regulate the destruction and injury of trees in, the, in woodlands. Um, the update, as I mentioned, would incorporate um, 
the, uh, sorry, the updates that I noted before, as well as incorporate policies that hadn't previously been considered at the time of drafting the 2006 bylaw, things such as the planning uh, process, how to incorporate environmental impact studies, natural heritage items as well. So staff have had the discussion that it would be necessary to redraft, uh, to draft a new bylaw. And I, I know I keep saying update the bylaw, but basically what staff has determined, given the changes that are necessary, it's actually um, necessary to, to do a complete rewrite uh, from the staffing, from staff perspective. We intend to include, uh, have a process in place in which we involve um, basically everybody that we can, but the list includes uh, municipalities, applicable agencies, members of the public, members of the forestry community, the agricultural community, the indigenous community. Um, we've already started uh, that process informally with the town of the Blue Mountains as they're undergoing uh, an update to their bylaw as well. So what we're looking for today, um, and I will come back to this slide at the end of my presentation, um, is what we want, what we want is, is to have a discussion with committee. We want to know your, th your thoughts. Um, do we want to keep uh, the, the intent of the bylaw the same? Do, do we want to change it? Do we need to clarify anything further? Do we need to modify anything? Um, are there things that have not been included that need to be? And are there any other considerations? So staff are recommending at this time that the recommendation be that we redraft the bylaw. And if anyone has any questions, feel free. So I'll go to questions. So just before I do that, I guess has the bylaw been working well? It's been serving its purpose, but we have been noting some challenges recently. Thank you, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I guess my, uh, my first thought would be that I, I think the intent of uh, a new bylaw would, uh, would, would, should line up with what the intent is currently. Uh, having been subject to the uh, bylaw a couple times over the years in my own property, I think it's worked well. Uh, the county staff, uh, Lee and uh, Carl before him, and certainly, uh, certainly the administrative staff here at the county have been very good to work with. Um, it concerns me a little bit that it would be suggested maybe an EIS wouldn't be needed for a minor exemption. Um, I just, I, I hate the thought of a solution looking for a problem. And if, if the current bylaw is working fine, then uh, the intent of a new bylaw should be similar. Um, the other uh, thing that I noted in here that caught my attention was uh, should the, uh, should the uh, new bylaw look into whether there's any increased protection needed for some woodlot features, example, fence rows? Well, I can tell you that will not be a crowd pleaser in the ag community, um, generally speaking. Uh, so if you're looking for a scrap, that'd be a good place to start. Uh, but, uh, that said, uh, have at it. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I thank you, uh, Councillor Millen, and I think I could probably concur with what you had said as, a, as an agricultural person. But, uh, um, Sarah, do you have any comments to that? I think right now we're just trying to gather as much information and, and uh, you know, if that's not an appropriate route to go, then that's not an appropriate route to go. We're just trying to cover all of our bases right now and determine what is appropriate, what isn't appropriate. Okay, I don't see any hands flying right now. Is there a cost for the application? The minor exemption application is a $355 charge for the year of 2020. So is there a cost when you're doing a woodlot harvest? The next question I have is, do you need a management forest plan to harvest or can you, if you said you, said you personally can mark it and you can harvest it, you don't need a management forest plan to harvest? We brought Lee. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Lee Thurston. I'm the Gray County Bylaw Officer for Forestry. You don't need a managed forest plan in order, in order to harvest your woodlot. One of the problems we have with the bylaw is that it allows circumference cutting. People that have their 
woodlots under managed forest are not allowed to cut to the circumference. It becomes my responsibility to make sure that that is not occurring, but it's not very easy for me to do because I don't have access to information that tells me that your woodlot is under managed forest. We do, we are able to get the information roundabout if I suspect, suspect that it is under managed forest. There's also been a few times where a property has been under managed forest, it's cut to good forestry, and then five or ten years later, a logger will approach the people. They're maybe thinking of selling the property. They cut it to the circumference and it's gone. So that's probably good a good conversation to have whether you're going out to the public or have that to, to understand that maybe in your application there's a box saying do you have a managed forest plan there is that in the application not all applications are filled out to a hundred percent okay uh, and what it does say that all applications need to be filled out and if they're not I can refuse them right there's quite often where an application will be submitted to me today and the logger wants to start tomorrow. Do I refuse the application because it hasn't been filled out properly or completely? If that's the case, I probably would be refusing 95% of the applications. So maybe there just needs to be a note in the industry that you do need to apply a week ahead, not the day ahead, just so you make sure you cover those boxes. The other question I have is the agricultural exemption. I know this sort of popped up a little bit from OFA or Great County Federation through what the Blue Mountains is going through and also the private property exemption like for firewood or whatever. Or not. And I, I, maybe that's something you're, you're going to get to by going through this process, but I know that's something that pops up from a private owner and an agricultural owner. I can maybe try and answer that. With regards to personal use, firewood and those sorts of things, there, there's already an existing exemption in the bylaw. Um, agricultural, it, there are some exemptions. Um, you're allowed to uh, clean up edges under certain circumstances. Um, I don't know, um, not, you can't just, if it, was, if it was farmed 20 years ago and it's grown up in a, in a bush, that's not necessarily uh, an opportunity that you get to, to do that, but um, without without a permit. Uh, so there there are differences in what's being requested within the agricultural realm of things. I guess where I was coming from is if you had softwood and you're 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 harvesting the timbers to build an outbuilding like from store round bills, or you're taking solid maple or beech to put in sleepers in your bank barn, that type of thing would be more of an agricultural purpose and and. And, and I think that would be considered an agricultural purpose on your own own property. That would be a personal use, and that would be permitted. Madam um, Sarah or or Lee, if I could ask, um, in order to have um, or to qualify for that managed forest tax incentive program, your plan has to be approved by a managed forest plan approver. Do we have a relationship with with? the folks who are doing that work in this area or does it happen by someone centrally somewhere? I actually, sorry. I actually looked this up the other day. On that, on the managed forest website, there is a, a, a list, I believe it's a comprehensive list of those that can um, approve those plans in this area. Well, actually in all of Ontario, I believe, yeah. I would think you probably would have a more <laughs> substantial relationship. Yeah, there's there's quite a few number of of approvers. Um, staff at Gray Sobel are plan approvers. There's private industry that are plan approvers, and we do have a relationship with M and R, the the administration of the program. Um, so if if I can, if I suspect that a property is under managed forest, I can check with M and R, and they will get back to me. But it does take time. Um, sorry. Okay. 
it just seems to me that that's information that should be available to us and 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 mapped that that should be a check that we that we can simply do without a lot of fuss maybe there's some more discussion through finance i'm not sure just before i go to questions for clarity if you have a 100 acre farm and you're farming it you don't need a managed forest plan to get the re exemption because you're at the farm exemption but if you're a rural owner and you have a woodlot and you want the, the uh, managed forest exemption you have to do a managed forest plan so there's a difference in the sense of two different types of property that you're dealing with uh, the in the sense of where you're running into it because generally if it's an agricultural piece it's already got that exemption right so just to put that out there for clarity okay I have a number of people that wish to ask and I'll go down the list here uh, first I have Councillor Robinson Thank you, Mr. Warden. I, I guess it's just a point of clarity and uh, basically just a statement. So I am pleased that uh, the agricultural community will be consulted on the new bylaw. I think that's really important for OFA and also Greer County Federation of Agriculture. So that's my statement. And my question is, what type of consultation will this, um, how, how will this consultation unfold? We haven't definitively set anything up. What we're hoping to do is to have some public forums, um, town hall meetings, those sorts of things. Um, we've discussed internally at a staff level um, to maybe try and reach out to those communities if they want to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but, um, and, we're, and some of those meetings, we'd obviously have one uh, here at the county, but then also trying to go to either uh, end of the of the uh, county so that we can make sure that we're reaching those people that may not necessarily be able to make it to here. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Thank you for that clarity. I would just ask that the draft bylaw could be circulated in advance of uh, perhaps the agricultural communities meetings. I think that would be most beneficial. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the next one is Councillor Potter. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, stress the need for communication uh, because that is something that we found with our bylaw is that uh, a lot of stakeholders that we weren't even really aware of uh, are there and they suddenly found themselves looking at a new bylaw that they didn't realize would affect them. Um, and they weren't sure how it would affect them. Um, do we have a way of differentiating between development, um, somebody clearing land for new development as opposed to someone involved in agriculture or just a landowner who has a sizable property that they like to, uh, that they manage the trees from, they occasionally harvest some for firewood or whatever. Um, and, and there has to be a difference so that we don't snag private landowners or farmers in with, uh, with people who are actually clear cutting or, or cutting a substantial number of trees from a development property. Um, we currently have, it's, it's lacking right now. And that's something that we wanted to discuss and as part, that's one of the, one of the uh, administrative things that we've been finding has been a little bit lacking. Um, so certainly that's something that we want to investigate. And obviously with in, in town of the Blue Mountains in particular, um, where our bylaw quote unquote ends, you know, maybe that's where their by, your bylaw comes in place so that they can work together. Um, currently uh, within for development there is an exemption uh, in place where a, a, an environmental process for example an EIS or a natural heritage study has or a natural environment study has been completed uh, they can be exempt but it's it's in um, in Blue Mountains case currently uh, we're dealing with um, before those approvals are in place because um, right now the and so we're trying to figure out what the what the uh, the, the place that we can uh, figure out wh what that balance is. Um, so certainly we're going to be looking into that more uh, throughout this process and we're going to be working with the municipalities uh, to try and figure out how to fill that gap. Uh, One other question, Sarah, if I can. I noticed that 
Um, many of our surrounding uh, counties refer to their bylaws as a forest conservation bylaw. And uh, just a, a difference in terminology, was there, is there a reason why ours is called a different name? I know. Okay, um, <laughs> I know that um, in our in Gray County, uh, we're very different in that we have such a high amount of forest cover in our county. I don't know if that is why um, we would have a, a management bylaw as opposed to a conservation bylaw because we have we have a lot like I know that uh, Huron County, for example, has far less forest cover, and so those that the forestry cover that they have, I would assume that they want to conserve it maybe more uh, than not not that we don't want to conserve our forest cover, but um, that uh, we have a little bit more flexibility in um, promoting management of it. I don't know if you want to speak any more to that or if there's anything more you want to add. Yeah, I just think it's a difference in wording and it was at the time of development. Heather was probably around when uh, it came up I think Bruce County's came first, and theirs is a conservation bylaw. Gray County's is a forest management bylaw. And I think it's just a matter of wording. Okay. But Perhaps in the, as we move through our, our climate change deliberations and that sort of thing, I noticed that the World Economic Forum announced today an initiative that they're to plant a trillion trees. So if we already have a lot of trees, Perhaps it's a good message to send that we want to conserve the ones we have where we can. Well, well certainly on the management forest or even the, the management bylaw, it protects the tree cover, right? It protects your, your harvesting it, but allows the, the new growth to come up and you're preserving what you got, right? Okay, so next is Council Debreen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. To touch on the Manage Forest Incentive Program, having gone through that process, the SVCA also is um, had or has done or offers that service to, they come on, they, they walk your property, they develop the plan with you, they assess when it had been harvested, the health of the forest, and then you enter into an agreement that you won't have a full harvest for a period of time and you you enter into that agreement and then at some point in time you can have that assessed at roma for the mike smithers question box i think it was i think it was norfolk county has a forestry bylaw that um, has a list of a professional uh, responsible markers uh, lee you're probably very familiar with this and if someone is entering into a healthy harvest of their managed forest or of a forest, they can contact the, the county, they, um, they enter into or they, they take and select a marker for their forest. If they select one of those professional markers and then they apply for the forest harvest, the I believe it's the application fee is waived, and once it's harvested, I think they get a 50% rebate on the professional marking. So it's to encourage responsible marking that they're taking the trees that they should be taking and nothing more. Um, it's just a suggestion. I know that the Managed Forest Incentive Plan, if you are part of it, is on the MPAC assessment and when you search the Gray County web the mapping for a certain property it shows whether you're in the uh, MFIP program I can speak to that personally so I just wanted to add that for clarification thank you, <clears throat> you Councilor Debreen I don't know if you have any comments to that Sarah Um, I, I don't know, 
I know that we they updated on the, the GIS regularly, but I'm not sure um, exactly. I, I can't speak to whether the the, the website to know uh, if that is 100% accurate, but certainly that is available, and um, we can make that available um, to to Lee when when needed. Um, I can just add that it's not 100% reliable. Okay, My property is under MIFTIP, but it's not recognized on the county map. Okay. And certainly, with regards to the Norfolk bylaw, we can look at it as an example uh, when we're doing going through the the process. It seems like they've got some good ideas. Certainly, during during a harvest time, and Lee will uh, agree to this. Like just for example, two weeks ago we had an ice storm, and there's damage happens to a tree. Then if you get damaged trees when you're going through harvest, you're going to try to deal with the damaged trees and keep the good ones for seed or whatever right you try to you try to look at it the best you can I'm, I'm sure that's when you're out there looking at whoever's marking right uh, next i have uh, councillor mackey uh, thank you warden so <coughs> through you sarah's got a number of questions here and i'm not i'm pretty sure i don't know the answer to most of them we do have a forestry committee i'm just wondering if these questions have been posed to the forestry committee or if they have any answers to some of these questions to share with us and if the questions haven't been posed to the forest committee why haven't they and could we get a report back from uh, the forestry committee randy Uh, so just on that, we do have a forest management plan advisory committee. So that, that advisory committee is looking after uh, and providing um, advice on, on the forest management plan. And we'll be actually bringing forward, uh, based on some of those recommendations from the advisory committee related to the forest management plan itself. The forest management plan is, is dealing with how we manage our county forests. Uh, whereas the forest manager bylaw applies to not only our county forests, but to all public and private lands and in terms of um, a bylaw that regulates uh, the enforcement of, of that. Um, so no doubt, uh, you know, there's some experts around that table uh, from a forest management plan advisory committee standpoint, uh, but the terms of reference are specific to the forest management plan. We will be definitely through the consultation process um, be engaging uh, some of the folks that are around that table. Um, there's some agricultural representatives and, and, and other forestry logging representatives. So um, no doubt as part of our consultation process, we'll be engaging them and then bringing back what we've heard from, from those, those groups and then preparing what we think needs to be in terms of amendments to the draft bylaw. Part of it will also be working with Michael and his team in terms of uh, making sure that from a legislative standpoint, we're addressing what we can uh, in our forest management bylaw. There are certain uh, restrictions on the Municipal Act in terms of what an upper tier can, can regulate, and basically it's anything that's a hectare or greater. Um, whereas local municipalities, they have the ability to have tree cutting bylaws and, and actually regulate down to a tree if they, if they so wish. And that's where, as Sarah indicated, it's key to work with those municipalities that have bylaws in place, uh, as well as to make sure our bylaws structure in a way that doesn't duplicate uh, where a municipality has uh, their own tree cutting bylaw and making sure that we're, our, the county is, is at a level of managing our forest throughout the county as opposed to managing tree cutting per se. Any other questions to this uh, item? I guess the only other question I have is we have the emerald ash bore, and do we need some language in there about moving that firewood or dealing with that that's not necessary? All restrictions on moving firewood have been removed. Um, basically within the hardwood region of Ontario and, and Manitoba and Quebec, you can move it anywhere you want. The, the government has given up on it. So just further that, if, if all of a sudden a particular landowner knows or has a concern that the emerald ash borer is coming, can they clear cut all the ash to protect? Or is there any wiggle room in that part? Uh, under the current bylaw, they cannot clear cut. We might want to consider uh, wording in the new bylaw regarding insects or disease infestations. That's. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions on that? Good discussion. Um, I have it moved by uh, Councillor Carlton, second by Councillor Robinson. Seeing no other discussion, all in favor? That is carried. I've been told by our watchers that I need to speak a little closer to the mic so they can hear us. So hopefully they're hearing us out there. So that's good. We're getting response from our watchers this morning. So, okay. Moving forward then to uh, our next item uh, regards to access to Councillor Portal for alternates. I guess who's, are you? Oh, Madam Clerk, the floor is yours. I got, I, I messed up here. I need a mover and a seconder, please. My clerk's not here to remind me, so. <laughs> Councillor Potter, Councillor Hutchinson. Madam Clerk, I'll get Thank you, Warden McQueen. Uh, the report before you was brought forward in response to a notice of motion uh, related to the provision of access to the council portal for, portal for alternate members. Just by way of a bit of background, uh, currently the, count, uh, the alternate member policy states that alternate members will be sent a link to the agenda package for all open portions of the meeting and closed material, whether it's uh, the minutes or a report, will be provided on paper um, on the day of the meeting and collected at the end. Um, all council documents, as council is very full aware, except for closed meetings, are posted on the county website. Everything there is public, and we go back many years there. So there is a lot of history with uh, what Gray County has been doing through council and, and committee of the whole and standing committees as well. Um, after the request was made, um, I reached out to a number of, of uh, other upper tier municipalities to determine what their processes are. I did hear back from three and those are outlined in the report. They were all in line with what we currently do with the exception of Wellington who does provide the closed session material in an email as soon as it uh, goes out, as soon as they're aware that um, they have an alternate member coming. So when Jody and I actually talked about um, the IT aspect of providing that and uh, we first thought there might be some license requirements but there isn't and it would just be um, a bit of IT time and I say a bit probably three or four days of IT time to reconfigure certain aspects of the portal to allow permissions to be set on a per meeting basis and that's recommend that staff's recommendation is that uh, portal access be applied to alternate members on a per meeting basis and the counselor who is not going to be in attendance would need to provide the clerk or deputy clerk um, notice that they're not coming so that we could have those permissions set and then it would be a, a login uh, similar to what you do now for the council portal for the alternate member to access that the documents for that meeting. Okay, thanks Madam Clerk and just for for timelines you like to have that like a, probably a week ahead right the policy right now says we i i like to have 10 days um because we do like to get our packages out seven days ahead of time um understanding that that's not always possible so as soon as possible is is great and sometimes things happen at the last minute too and people can't make it and, and all that stuff okay uh, questions questions Councillor Debreen. Through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, as an alternate, I have some concern about access to closed session documents that given that your site, your portal, has years of closed session documents and having access to those that I wouldn't have been privy to before will the login access that you're looking at, the three to four days to, to set it up, restrict access to the documents for the day only, and so that would therefore protect <coughs> any prior closed session items. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Warden, that's exactly it. The permissions will be set on a per meeting basis, so Alternates attending County Council for that day will have access to the closed session material for that meeting only and nothing from the background. Okay, thanks for that question. Are there any other questions into this report? So I guess the other thing is if, if they if it's the last minute then it'd be in paper, right? So, okay. Seeing there's no, that was uh, moved by Councillor Potter, second by Councillor Hutchinson. All in favor of that? 
that is carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next one uh, is with regards to uh, OPSU and Memorandum of Settlement. And uh, Grant, how are you doing? Good. Thank oh, sorry. Yep, yep, yep. Hang on. Movers, I, Councilor Millen, I'm slipping now. Second by Councilor Clumpus. Thank you, Mr. Warden and County Council. What we have here is the first ratification report that you'll receive uh, from Human Resources for 2020. And this is for social services. With the assistance of Barb Fady and uh, another manager, a couple of other people, um, we sat down three separate times with social services for the uh, negotiations for their new collective agreement. You will remember that there was a mandate of 1.62% that came out of County Council in 2019. And we managed through the negotiations to stick to that 1.62%. This is a two-year agreement where they would receive the increase January 1st of this year and January 1st of next year. In addition, we did some surveying before negotiations in regards to vacation entitlement. One of the things, among a lot of other stuff that social services and OPSI requested during these negotiations, was different benefits and an increase in their vacation entitlement. Through discussions with the report, speaking with our CAO, and speaking with Barb, we decided to go ahead and change the vacation entitlement. So we are now at six weeks after 20 years and five weeks after 12 years. So in the report, you'll see that is a uh, improvement. We have not moved on the vacation for 20, 25 years. Um, and that's something that after the survey, the average is about 20 years for six weeks. We were falling behind and uh, that's okay. It's okay to fall behind sometimes, but uh, we felt it was the right time to make a bit of a change there. Offering more vacation for less years of service is a tricky thing. One of the things we look at is, are these people being replaced? If they're not being replaced, it's a bit of an easier answer because there's not a direct cost, although they're not here for that extra week earlier. Wouldn't be the same for long-term care, and you won't see me coming forward with any changes for vacation for those people who have to be replaced, like long-term care, paramedics, things like that. So it's a fairly straightforward report. There are no other benefit increases for this, and we have stuck with the mandate of 1.62%. One of the things I'd like to say is social services employees have already ratified this agreement. And getting an agreement at 1.62, the council mandate with OPSU is a big deal because we are also negotiating with Lee Manor, Gray Gables, EMS. All of these kind of show a precedent and we're hoping that if uh, they're taking 1.62 for social services, they'll agree to do that in the remainder of the negotiations over the next 12 months. Thanks, Grant. Any questions to uh, Councillor Mackey? Thanks, Warden, and through you to Grant. So can, I'm just not sure, Grant, if I got you correctly. We have different holiday entitlements for different staffing groups throughout the county. That's correct. They are all different. We try and uh, we really try and make everything the same for everybody. But what happens is you have groups that are able to go to arbitration. And through arbitration, you will find that for both EMS and for ONA, for our registered nurses in the homes for the aged, they have even increased vacation entitlement over top of what, say, non union has, social services, and so on. So depending on the bargaining group depends on where you'll see the vacation entitlements. Most of them are the same, but you'll see a few uh, outliers there, and they are as a result of uh, arbitrations that uh, you know, we put our uh, information forward, the union does, and sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. So you'll see a seven-week vacation entitlement for ONA. I believe there's also a seven-week vacation entitlement for EMS, depending on the years of service. It's usually 25 or... Um, 27 years of service, something like that. 
So short answer is yes. There are differences. So if I may, would the, would the hospital work the same way? I mean, they have a variety of unions at the hospital. Would they work the same way as an employee? Employer? <laughs> Madam, Madam CEO. So just in the sense of what the CEO is saying is we're starting to get into discussions around particular agreements and everything around like that. So I guess in the sense if you want a further conversation or if you want more in depth, then we need to go on camera. Grant? If I could, the information that we've provided right now is all public. Uh, these collective agreements are online through the Ministry of Labor and all of the vacation entitlements out there are a uh, uh, public record. In regards to what the hospital does with their unions, if they have different unions, chances are that they're likely have different vacation entitlements. They're with the same union as our <coughs> registered nurses for their registered nurses, so their vacation entitlement would likely be the same as our registered nurses. So just in summary, it depends with what union you're dealing with, right? That's correct, and I, again, I agree with the uh, CAO. If there's more in-depth questions in regards to these negotiations, we should probably go on camera. Councillor Burley. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Mr. Warden. Uh, it was an open session that we agreed that we'd try to go for 1.62 in our negotiations. Uh, was that per year? Because Hang on, we just need some clarity on that. Just hang on, Madam Clerk. Or how do we want to address that? Because that's going down another rabbit hole, right? It is. So, Madam Clerk, do you wish to? Well, it, help me out here, Madam Seal. <laughs> just hold on that thought, okay? Just in the sense of, it, I think some of that was maybe not here, <laughs> but it is in your report. So, Madam Seal. I think if I'm hearing Councillor Burley. You were, you were asking for clarity around the mandate that was provided, the negotiating mandate, about whether or not that, the, the threshold was for the entire period of the collective agreement or an annually. Grant. That mandate, and when we're looking for a mandate from County Council, we have collective agreements that can go anywhere from a year to three years. So always the mandate is an annual increase. It's a cost of living increase, essentially. And if you're ever giving me a mandate, let's say for instance of 1.62, that's for each year of the collective agreement, much the same as you would see uh, increases for uh, non-union and the other unions that we have. Okay, I, you can see where we get into some sensitive discussions. Councillor Mackey again. So just to be clear, when we give the mandate of 1.2 or 6.2, that's not inclusive of benefit costs or grant? The 1.62 is a total compensation um, mandate. So for instance, if somebody, if, if a union is looking for a, a one, let's say we can negotiate a 1% increase, the remainder of the 0.62 could be used for anything. Um, but it is all-inclusive. That 1.62 doesn't mean that's wages, and then we go ahead at the table and start bargaining hundreds of thousands of dollars in benefits. So it's all closed in total compensation as the mandate. Okay, thanks for that discussion. Uh, anybody else have any? Further? Maybe everybody's scared to ask a question now. <laughs> any further questions? All right, that was moved by Councillor Millen, second by uh, Councillor Compass. Seeing there's no more questions, all in favor? That is carried. All right, thanks, Grant. At this time on our agenda, we have the next uh, closed session uh, portion of our meeting. And I need, a, and it's identified within our minute, or sorry, our agenda. So I need a mover and a seconder, Councillor O'Leary, Councillor Patterson. Uh, who's staying from a staff perspective? So Kim, Tara, myself. Kim, Michael, Tara. Michael, Pat, um, Sharon Melville is here, and Steve Dahlmer is here, who's our manager of maintenance. So if you didn't hear a name, you have to leave. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry, but we'll be, we won't be that long, so thank you. Randy should probably oh, Randy. Sorry. Randy. Randy should. Yeah. Okay, there's been a real life of...